Hello everyone, this is Michael Phoenix of Solutions IQ. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Davil Panchal's Keeping a Healthy Product Backlog presentation. Davil has 10 years of experience in the field of information technology, helping companies to add value to their projects and build good software. He's a certified Scrum trainer, an Agile coach, and a Scrum and Agile consultant who has consulted with many major companies. And he's here today to talk to you about how to keep your product backlog an effective tool for project management. Davil? Thank you, Mickey, and thank you all for joining us. So um, as we begin this presentation, I wanted to talk about what a product backlog is. And my point of view is that a product backlog is a tool. Uh, the tool helps you maximize the return on investment of your software development efforts, manage your risks, and have a clear view of what is the workload that your teams, uh, it could be a single team or multiple teams, all working from a single product backlog. And your entire backlog represents the load that is being put onto your team to go ahead and develop. Now, having a healthy product backlog allows you to enhance the value and improve the return on investment for your product. During this presentation, I'm going to talk about some of the underlying concepts that help you understand why it is necessary to have a healthy product backlog, then look at some of the challenges that we face in order to keep this product backlog in a healthy state. We'll look at what are some of the possible <coughs> remediation measures that you can take so as to keep it healthy as you move along. One of the first things that I want to distinguish for product backlog management, and in fact, even agile, from a traditional way of thinking is that traditionally we've looked at our constraints to be our features. We ask our uh, end users, our business owners, other people to tell us all the features that they need in order to build this product right. Once we have all of that understanding of features, which we often call as requirements, we go ahead and estimate the cost and schedule for your projects. Through this cost and schedule, we come up with a plan. And this is the plan that we are going to execute upon in order to deliver all the features that your business needs. Typically, it is about a year-long effort where you spend the first few months detailing out all the features, then spending a, a month or so figuring out what's the cost and schedule and creating a plan, and the rest of the months are spent in protecting this plan. Now, the firm belief in that notion is that we already know what we need one year from today, assuming that we are going to release this product in a year. When Agile, we get away from that assumption and we say, let's flip this triangle around. Let's figure out our constraints as cost and schedule. Your schedule is constrained by your sprint time box, which could be two weeks or four weeks. And your cost is the cost of your development teams in order to develop during the time period. And now the estimate revolves around figuring out what is the most valuable feature that we can deliver within this time box, which we have the constraints of cost and schedule. Now, in order to guide our effort in this paradigm, we need to have a vision of where we are trying to go. And that vision is provided by your product owner, which is supported by the organization who has empowered the product owner to go ahead and build a product that aligns with this vision. The day-to-day -day activity of a product owner and the team that works onto this product is to enhance the value of your product as it moves along through multiple sprints or iterations. And in that notion, we figure out what are the highest priority features that we are going to work upon. And based on that, we will deliver what is needed. Now, within the academic world, there has been a lot of research that has gone into understanding the nature of software systems as they exist past 1990s. Prior to the 1990s, most of the computer software work was algorithmic. What that meant was that if we can figure out the algorithm, then we can have uh, developers and uh, software professionals create a solution that follows a clear logical path of deduction. And with that, you can figure out a solution. Now with interactive systems, systems that require your users to interact with your end users, the dynamic has completely changed from an algorithmic mindset. And in this new paradigm, what we have to acknowledge is that most of our users will never know what they want, but they will always know what they don't want when they see it. So when you demonstrate your piece of software to your end users or your product owner 
or other people who are involved with the use of this product, they can always tell you by looking at the working piece of software what they don't like and what they would like. The key in a new modern software development is to understand that there is always going to be an emergence of requirements, which means that thinking higher or thinking longer will not provide you with all the requirements up front. Traditionally, by fixing the amount of features that we are going to develop, we have trained our end users into thinking that they can actually think of all the business needs and future conditions that is going to exist within their businesses to give the features right up front, that is today. We have trained our end users to think harder. We have trained our end users to tell us all the requirements up front. And in that whole process, what has happened is our users have given us what they need right now, what they may need tomorrow, and just in case if you are late, might as well give us a few more requirements. With that, we have a whole host of requirements that bloats up our plan and we end up with systems which are potentially used or sometimes not even used. And this is validated by a standards group study that was done in 2000. This is the chaos report where they looked at close to about 4,400 industry projects. And through that, they discovered that close to 45% of all the features that are being developed into our projects are never used. That's quite a statistic. We have about 7% that is always used, 13 that is often, and 16% that is sometimes used. Now, if you just look at that statistic and think about your product, the one that you're working upon, do you find some features that are not being used into your systems? I think there are. And that's the key. When we force our users to come up with all the requirements up front, we are forcing them to decide what they would potentially use, but they never end up using it. Now, if we were to have a mechanism to show our software to our end users and learn from their usage of their software system and only deliver what they will always use or often use, we can dramatically improve the return on investment because by not developing those extra features, you are removing the cost of maintenance, you're removing the cost of analysis, development, testing, all the other aspects that go into building a quality software product. Now, I can understand there are some features that are rarely used, sometimes like financial applications which have yearly budgeting expense or some amount of calculations that happen because of the financial cycles. And that is okay. The key over here is to narrow down what your users truly need and to eliminate everything that the users will never use. Now, how does Agile help us? I'm going to use the Scrum framework as a point of reference to talk about how Scrum helps us manage to the value and the vision of the product that you're trying to build. You have a product owner who is responsible to own the product backlog, prioritize the product backlog, and define the product backlog items. There is a Scrum delivery, excuse me, <coughs> there's a Scrum delivery team that pulls a set of highest priority product backlog items and breaks them down into smaller sprint backlog items, which happens into your sprint planning meeting. As they move along during the iteration, which is a fixed time box, also called as a sprint, the team executes on these sprint backlog tasks in order to produce a working piece of software at the end of the iteration. They manage their work within the sprint by means of a daily stand-up meeting. At the end of your sprint, you, the team demonstrates what is being delivered as piece of working software, and that is being reviewed by the product owner and also your end users and other people who have a stake into the development of this product. They provide feedback, and this feedback goes back into your product backlog by means of new product backlog items. So the whole development within the Scrum framework is about taking partial concepts, just enough to go ahead and develop within a sprint and put it back into a potentially shippable state and show it to your end users. And through this activity of reviewing with your end users, you validate whether your partial concepts were good enough. Well, if they are, then let's define a few more product backlog items that will help us solidify this feature. And if they are not, then how can we improve it? It's a constant feedback mechanism that happens on every single sprint. 
the core vision of behind having a product backlog and even in Scrum is to have your business drive your development. If you think about it, most of us think that yes, of course, business drives our development. Isn't that true? Well, sometimes it is not because we have constraints and we have levers that we have not exposed to our business which allows our business to then be uh, dependent on what the technology folks can figure out and what they want to do. By providing a single backlog, by providing a single list of prioritized items that the business desires, the business is communicating, this is what is most important to our business. And by the development teams working on to these items, we are actually meeting your business needs. Now, there are certain cases when this does not happen. We'll look at some of those challenges. The key that I'm going to hit upon in this session is how a product backlog, a healthy product backlog, helps your business drive to development. Let's look at a backlog. Now, this is a ideal backlog, and I'm going to describe all the characteristics that are involved with a product backlog. You have a product backlog where all the items have a clear priority, which means that no two items carry the same priority. You have item number one, then number two. There are no two items that have the same priority. The items which are much higher in priority, which means that they are likely to be taken into your next sprint or the sprint after that, are smaller in size and they have high amount of detail. The items which are not relevant for the next couple of sprints and most likely to be part of a future release are at the most bottom of your product backlog. They tend to be in larger in size and they carry less detail around them. Now, in this product backlog, it is it's, it's, it's a, the key is to is to understand that the product backlog is not a static set of requirements. It is a dynamic piece of requirements which constantly changes. So you have some items that get reprioritized at any time. So a product owner, while the team is working on the sprint, can reprioritize and rechange the priorities within the product backlog. And some items which are lower in priority can get higher up into priority. As items that are much bigger and they get higher into priority, because we have to provide small size and high detail for high priority items, these items will be split at any time. And there may be some items which are not necessary anymore and they can be removed from your product backlog. The key about the product backlog is that it is always owned by the product owner. Anyone with any organization can add to the product backlog. By adding to the product backlog, the team members or the stakeholders or other people are providing a sense of what is most valuable for them into this product. Now, it's the responsibility of the product owner to go ahead and prioritize these concepts within the product backlog. Think about a product backlog as a queue. Now, when you go to, say, a movie theater and you are there to buy a ticket, when you stand in a queue, you are part of the product backlog that the movie hall has to process. Now, if you're not in the queue, then you don't exist as far as the movie theater is concerned. And that's the key. A product backlog represents every single item that the team is going to work upon. And if there are some items that the team is working upon and they are not part of your product backlog, then they don't exist. That's a good practice to follow because if you don't have all the items in your product backlog, then the notion of load or the amount of work that is remaining to be done by your team is not known. And it is invisible to the team, to the product owner, and to the rest of the organization. Let's look at the very first challenge that most of us face when we have a product backlog, and that is to have a single product backlog. In my uh, coaching experience with Solutions IQ and my colleagues over here, we have often went into organizations where the team or multiple teams are pulling from a product backlog which contains all the product features. However, within the sprint, they are also working on bugs, they're also working on customer service changes, and if they have time, they're trying to improve the technical competency of their product by maintaining a separate backlog, which is the technical product backlog. Now, having all these different lists feeding into a single Scrum team or into a single product development 
defocuses the entire team. There is no way for business to prioritize between the technical backlog items or from the product backlog bug fixes or from the features, which often results into a set of features that do not conceptually fit together. So although you may have the good technical competency to build every feature of the highest quality, these features will not fit together to provide a conceptual hold and a better user experience for your end users. The key over here is to now merge all of these separate backlogs into a single product backlog. When you have a single product backlog where the product owner can prioritize between bugs, features, and the technical aspects and have a conversation with the team to make sense of what is the most conceptual product that can go out. That's the key. Now, saying that you have to merge all of these different product backlogs into a single product backlog is easy. But how do you actually do it? And I've seen a pattern that has worked for us in many uh, situations. Uh, first example that I want to share is of a Fortune 10 company where we had about uh, 12 stakeholders interested in the outcome of a product and two scrum teams working off from the single product backlog. Now, in this case, we had 12 peers or stakeholders providing input and they actually had really good inputs to be providing to the team. But the team was completely defocused because they were working on disparate features all at the same time. And when we held a retrospective, it came out that they were completely confused about the vision and the direction of this product. So one of the things that this group decided to do was first to meet prior to the team's sprint planning meeting and have a clear understanding amongst themselves of what is the product backlog and how they can merge their separate requirements and needs into a single list. What that required them to do is to nominate a product owner from that committee of 12 people. Now, the key behind this group, which is also called as the product definition group, is that every single member of the product definition group provides some expertise or domain knowledge in order to build the product. But they all empower one single person, which is your product owner, to make decisions for the team and have a single prioritized list that the entire team can work off. By having this free product definition group, you can have inputs from different parts of your organization. Now, this, is, this can include different people. It could include your enterprise architects. It could include customer service representatives, stakeholders, IT operations, business analysts, salespeople, all providing input to the product owner and supporting the role of the product owner by providing definition around the product backlog items, but allowing the product owner and empowering the product owner to prioritize these items against all the other items. And that is the key to have a single responsible customer voice who can now interact with the team with a single list. The next challenge that I want to talk about is now that you have these different lists and you have agreed to create and merge it into a single list, how do you actually go about to prioritize all of these different list items against each other? It's hard to get a stack ranked prioritized list. How can you prioritize between a feature, between a bug, or a technical item? And even if you have a clear understanding of priorities, how do you aggregate this understanding across multiple stakeholders and get them to agree upon the prioritized list? Now, prioritizing between a feature and a bug and a technical item can be difficult because sometimes bugs have a lot of detail in terms of reproduce, reproduction um, instructions. How do you actually reproduce this information? Technical items may be communicated in a way that do not really make sense for your product owner. For example, uh, we should have a database that will allow for 10,000 users. Hmm, what does that mean in business terms? Well, if you can abstract the business value of each of these separate items into something that expresses the business value that the product will provide, then there is a shot at prioritizing these different perspectives into a single product backlog. And that mechanism is called as a user story. A user story always represents a thin slice of vertical functionality 
that has business value to your end users. So in this case, the feature has a business value that allows you to know when to expect your package. A bug allows your customer service to receive 20 fewer calls, which can be translated into the amount of effort spent per call, and that's the business value benefit on a daily basis. By having 10,000 concurrent user requests handling, you are allowing for your software to be scalable across multiple domains and multiple people. Now, having this notion of priority that transcends uh, the individual perspectives and comes across as a business value perspective allows your product owner to say, should we add in a new feature or should we allow more users to use our existing set of features? There are other characteristics that you may want to consider when you are trying to relatively prioritize your product backlog. The business value is a primary determinant. What is the most valuable thing that we can do from a business perspective? Sometimes it's also about the cost of development. Where is it that I can get the most bang for my buck? If there is a feature that is of highest value but it will cost you close to two or three sprints as opposed to a feature that provides a medium range value but it costs you only a little or half a sprint and that's something that you may choose to prioritize just because the investment that you make in building that feature is far lower and your return on investment is higher on the on the medium value feature over the highest value feature the thing about building software is that it is a knowledge effort every time when you are trying to build a piece of feature you're taking these partial concepts out into your end users and learning from that process to build the next set of highest value features. So sometimes you may prioritize based on the learning that you want to achieve on building this completely new product. There may be some uncertainties that you want to alleviate before you commit your entire product vision onto building iPhone apps, for example. How do we actually integrate with the rest of the stuff that we are trying to build within our product line? Does it actually work? maybe one of the first things you would prioritize is to do a story that allows you to do that and learn the technical implications of building that type of feature or functionality. So there are many, many factors that come into prioritizing your product backlog. And by having a product definition group that brings in these perspectives from business side, from the architecture side, from IT operations, and even from the customer service people, you are getting all of these inputs, but how do we actually get to reconcile all of these inputs and create a single prioritized list? My first suggestion is to get all of them into a single room. And I want to talk about a technique that you can use when you have your product definition group meeting every time before the sprint planning session. This could be about two to three days or even a week before your sprint planning session to look at your product backlog and reprioritize so that the team is always pulling from the highest priority items. I call it the dot voting technique. And this technique is very simple. As a product owner or even your scrum master can facilitate the session where all the members of your product definition group are provided with four or five dots. Take all of your product backlog items and print them out into cards or into a half a page so that they are all independently movable and place all of them onto a single wall. Now, ask all of your stakeholders or the members of the product definition group to use their dots and vote on something that is the highest priority for them. They have the option of placing all of their dots onto a single item because that is the highest priority item or to spread it across multiple items. Now, when all the members are done with voting onto this big wall, which probably has about 50 or 60 product backlog items, you will see the items that have been voted and items that have not been voted on. Take all the items that have been voted and place them onto a different wall in a decreasing order of the number of points or the number of dots that they have received. So in this example, you have the first item that has five dots, the next has four, and the following one has two, and one. Now this is the highest priority of the big subset of product backlog items that you have created. Now repeat this process again. Give each of your stakeholders four more dots and ask them to re-vote onto the items that have not been voted yet. If you repeat this process 
often enough you can get to a list of product backlog items that has a notion of priority from all different stakeholders who are interested in the development of this product. The key thing that I talked about for a product definition group to work is to have the product owner who is empowered to make decisions when there are disagreements. So when you have two items that have the same number of dots, it's the product owner's decision of which of those two items will have a higher priority. And that's the key for having a group work with the product backlog and prioritizing these items and deciding what's the, what's the most valuable thing we can do in order to build to the vision of our product. Mike Cohen in his book, User Stories Applied, talks about the simple rule. When there is a disagreement to the sequence, the customer wins every time. The customer in this case, uh, if we talk about Scrum, is the product owner, who is the customer proxy, the single voice representing the needs of your customer. And everyone else in the product definition group is supporting the product owner to elicit what the customer needs. But at the end of the day, it is still the product owner who is the single ringable neck, responsible for delivering a product that will actually succeed into the marketplace. Within your product backlog uh, prioritization session, using the dot voting technique, you may also include your team members to provide technical inputs. The key over here is that irrespective of the feedback from the team and from the rest of the stakeholders, it's the product owner's responsibility to gain an understanding of their concerns and then finally decide on what is the highest priority item. Let's look at the next challenge that most of us face in keeping a product backlog in a state where it is always prioritized, where we have the highest priority items in small enough size and higher detail, and having the highest priority items, or sorry, the lowest priority items in larger size with less amount of detail. The next challenge I want to talk about is when we have too many product backlog items. I've seen this happen in cases where uh, we have unfinished tasks or bugs that could not be completed. So you pulled in the product backlog item into your sprint, and that product backlog item could not be completed by the team. And all the tasks and the bugs that were created in the process are now added into the product backlog. And the second challenge that we face when we have too many product backlog items is a case of over-specification. Let's dig into the first one. If a part of a story is not done, then the entire story is not done. And done is relation to the definition of done that your team has defined for each product backlog item. Now, when you take a simple user story or a product backlog item that is part of your sprint, and in that process you created many tasks and only four or five of those tasks were done, but some of the tasks were not completed and they were remaining because you didn't have time, and while actually creating this uh, feature into your code base, new bugs were created. Now one approach is to add all the bugs and incomplete tasks back into the product backlog, which I recommend not to be done because that explodes the number of product backlog items that you have into your product backlog. Instead, what, what I recommend is to take the product backlog item and prioritize that within your product backlog and throw away all the tasks that were not completed. The bugs that were created in that process can be added into your bug tracking system or somewhere else. But the key over here is that when the team took on to this product backlog item, they said we will build this item so that it provides a value to your end user. Now in that process, if that value or that intention is not being met and the entire story is not being done, the next time you pick up this item to provide the same value back to your end users, you will pick up remaining tasks and the bugs that it has created to improve your product. Uh, this thing is a bit hard to catch when you actually look into a team. One of the first simplest guidelines, if you cannot physically point to two separate physical artifacts, one which is your product backlog and the second which is your sprint backlog, then I'm, my, my guess is that this is what is happening, where you have tasks that are remaining into your sprint, they seep into your product backlog, Although they may be tagged as tasks, but it gets difficult because in your Excel spreadsheet, now you have about 2,000 items, half of which are tasks and some of which are product backlog items. 
And as a product owner, if I'm looking at all of this information, so much of it's so overwhelming that I cannot even look at some of the features that I've added just yesterday because they are now lost in this big list of, of rows and rows of Excel spreadsheets. So to keep it simple, only prioritize what the product backlog item is and throw away all the remaining tasks and the bugs that were created. The next challenge is of over-specification. And that goes back to the notion of uh, requirements taken as a static set of requirements. I'm going to go back to the triangle that we talked about first in our presentation. The triangle about defining all the features up front and then figuring out what the cost and schedule is. In that case, we were thinking of product backlog items as or requirements as a static set of requirements, something that would say stay stable for about a year or even longer. Now, in that case, we have created documentations which go close to 200 pages or so, and uh, then we create a plan around that documentation to actually go ahead and develop software. With the product backlog, you're working with a dynamic set of requirements, requirements that constantly change, requirements that are progressively refined, requirements that are not the same as you thought of one month from now. And in that notion, you cannot work with a stack of requirements and translate all of those into individual product backlog items because almost 45% of those items will never be used. So the key over here is to not is not to translate your requirements word by word or line by line from your use cases into product backlog items. The key over here is to get away from the notion where a business analyst job or someone who is providing the business domain, the traditional notion of a business analyst job is to create documentation and that documentation will provide understanding when someone else reads it. Is the key is to get away from that notion and to get into a mindset where it's all about creating an understanding. Now in this case, uh, the picture that I've shown is from a Fortune 10 oil and gas company and they're building a multi-million dollar project and they're doing it by means of having product backlog items up on the wall with the product owner and the business analyst having a conversation with the team, providing clarification for items that are going to be part of the next sprint. You see team members asking questions, making notes, adding extra description. They are not focusing on items that are further away. They are not focusing on items that are five sprints forward. They're only focusing on what is relevant for the next sprint, getting into the details of that information and then having enough understanding to go ahead and estimate these items. So the role of a business analyst now is not to create all the understanding up front. It's actually to provide just enough information so that the development team members can go ahead and develop and to gain enough learning from the technical capability of your team to understand what could be possible in the next few sprints and then defining those items in detail. There's a great article on a blog uh, that we post. It's called uh, The Game of Asteroids. It's been written by Thomas, who is my colleague at Solutions IQ, and he uh, equates this notion of breaking down product backlog items into a game of asteroids. I highly recommend that you take a look at this article because it talks about this little tiny spaceship that is going through a sea of asteroids and it has to break down these asteroids into small enough pieces so that they don't come and hit you and game's over. And you also have to focus your energy on only splitting the items that are in your path and ignore all those big boulders that are no longer in your path. With Agile, you're always moving and changing direction so it's not necessary that you describe every single big feature in its entire detail. Some of them you may just whiz past and would never develop. So why spend all the effort developing those items? And I highly recommend this article because it, it's very interesting. The next challenge I want to talk about is that the backlog is not ready for your team. It's hard to split user stories. You may have a product backlog which has very few items, but when you talk to your team members, they say this item is so big, it'll take us about two to three sprints. And sometimes, when you have product backlog items, 
and the team does not even understand how to go ahead and what's the requirements, how do you deal with that situation? So here are some smells. A smell is something that just does not sound right. It's, it's, it's a thing that you don't exactly know what's the real cost for this, but you know it's not right and there is a room for improvement. So here are some common smells. When uh, teams, they start doing user stories or having requirements that are expressed in terms of business value, uh, they try to split uh, these big user stories initially along process lines. This is in alignment with the way we have always thought about software development in terms of designing it first and coding it and then testing and then documentation. So you have stories that are split along the first story is about design, second story is about coding, the third story is about test. The issue with this kind of splitting is that when even one of these stories are developed, there is no business value that is provided at the end of the development. Well, when the teams get past that, uh, that, that mental block, they sometimes get into this notion of building it across architectural lines, where a story is split into, let's define the entire database so that we can build the set of features. Then we'll figure out the entire business tier, and if we have time, we'll get to the UI. And the issue with that is your end users do not know SQL. They do not know how to write REST clients. They understand how to use web browsing capabilities. So you need to have a UI in order, in order for that feature to be usable. And sometimes when you do all of that, the big picture, the, the core value that you're trying to provide with that feature is lost. So how do we split user stories? So here are a few guidelines. Let's say you're trying to build a feature that uh, provides the entire employee information up onto a, a web page. Now, one way is to figure out uh, the employee name, address, email information, and all the supporting information and building a feature that provides all information at once. If that story is too big for your team to develop, maybe you can split it across lines where the first story you develop is to fetch the employee record and only display the employee ID and the employee name. In the next story, you can beef up this feature by providing extra information like the address, like contact information, and other supporting details as to how long they've been with this organization. Are they still uh, in, in line for promotion? All of these information can be beefed up over time. Sometimes you have uh, stories that can be split across operational boundaries. Maybe you are adding a new person. The feature that you're trying to build is to add a new person to the insurance plan that the company provides. Well, the first thing you can do is build a feature that allows you to read all the people who have already subscribed to this information. The next feature you can provide is the ability to create and update these records because people change homes and there are changes in personal life, so you want that feature next. Guess what? Sometimes you cannot delete features. Why do we even go ahead and build functionality to delete records when the regulations ask for you to maintain that record for about seven years on your live database? So by splitting across these operational boundaries, you can individually prioritize what you want to do. Sometimes building just for a uh, happy path is good enough because it is an internal set of users who are going to use it and they are well trained on the business processes that apply for this piece of functionality. Maybe you can develop the happy path first which takes care of almost 80% of all the scenarios and then build on specific exception cases rather than figuring out all the what if scenarios and building all of that together. Removing cost cutting concerns and that talks about uh, having a feature or a functionality such as logging or security that cuts across every single feature that you are trying to develop. Now, when you split a story in a way to remove this cross-cutting concern, like saying, let's implement a feature that only enables a logging component that can be then reused by all the features, you are splitting the story into two discrete pieces of functionality, one that provides a direct visible value to your end users and the other that allows you to implement the logging aspect and the security aspect of your features. Now, uh, I also talked about uh, the whole software development effort as being a knowledge driven effort and in that case sometimes when you cannot split a big user story 
it's an indicator that there is a lack of understanding. That understanding could be in terms of not understanding what is the technical implications or the implementation for this story, or sometimes not even understanding how your users are going to use it. Now, in these cases, uh, these big stories can be, can be worked upon by means of some special story types. The first one is a spike, which is a quick and dirty implementation just to get enough technical understanding so that you can go ahead and develop it into your following sprints and estimate the stories. The key about a spike is that whatever functionality that you're developing is throw away code. It's never to be put into production. A research is gaining a broad foundational knowledge. Maybe you're trying to select a custom off-the-shelf product, and in that case, you want to go ahead and look at all the features of different products that are out there in the market, get enough information to select a few so that you can do a spike, and from that spike, you can learn about which actual product you're actually going to integrate with your product. And in order to do that, you may try to implement a tracer bullet. A tracer bullet is a thin slice of vertical functionality that is of production quality that goes from the start where the end user is actually going to use the system to the core of the system. And it demonstrates that all of these stacks of architecture actually plug in and play well together. These special user story types can be used by the team as a staging mechanism to understand what is the next set of items that the team can work on into the following sprint? It provides you as a product owner a notion of what is the cost of actually implementing this cool new feature that everyone likes. Maybe it is too expensive to even attempt it. The next challenge I want to talk about is sometimes we don't have enough information about the user stories that we are trying to develop. The key about user stories is that it is a card, it's a conversation, and it also carries with it a, converse, a confirmation. This is what Ron Jeffries talks about when he talks about user stories. Uh, a confirmation means that it carries a notion of acceptance criteria, some way for the team to understand that they have developed enough of this functionality. So when you create your product backlog items, it's important to provide this notion of acceptance criteria. And to get to this notion of what it means to be acceptable, you may have to take part into what is called as a product backlog grooming session. A product backlog grooming session is a place where you can address the dynamic nature of the requirements that your teams are going to work upon. By that, I mean that that is the time when the team and the product owner can work together prior to the sprint planning to understand, do we really know what features are coming up? Is our product backlog healthy? Well, if it's not, we have some tools to make it better. Should we merge these features or express these into terms of business value? Should we actually split these items because they are of higher priority now? We've looked at some of the ways of splitting these product backlog items. Do we actually have to develop these product backlog items based on what we learned from a sprint planning or the sprint review in the last sprint? All of these discussions are happening, and what comes out from your product backlog grooming session is a product backlog that has higher detail up top. It has estimates for all the product backlog items. You have acceptance criteria for all the backlog items that you are going to work on. And if needed, you are also supporting these backlog items with additional information. And by that, I mean that there may be some documentation that gets tagged along with your user story. This could be related to business rules that are not changeable. This could be related to UI specs, or it could be about the wireframe that you want to expect from the UI. All of the supporting documentation is developed as and when needed, and this understanding is gained into your product backlog grooming session. My recommendation is to spend about 5% of the team's capacity into this grooming session. So for a single team that is working upon a two-week sprint, at least two hours every single sprint is spent by the product owner with the team and, if needed, other stakeholders to groom the product backlog so that it is in a state where the team can pull the highest priority items and develop it into the next sprint. For me, a good product backlog has about 100 items and no more. If you are working from a product backlog that has more than 100 items, prioritizing these items is going to be a challenge. 
having a way to look into all of these items and understanding what is going to be part of our next sprint will be a challenge. So minimize the number of product backlog items that you have. Always have enough information onto your product backlog. Have a clear sense of stack rank priority in each of these items. So there is no confusion in the sense of which one should we do first. And always groom the product backlog prior to the sprint planning. You can split larger user stories. And when you split it, split them across the business value so that you are clear on what is the business benefit in order to, that you will get by developing this feature. And the most important that I feel is that every single product backlog item has acceptance criteria along with it. So your team knows that when they have finished the development, they have a means of asserting, yes, it meets the acceptance criteria for this story. The whole topic of uh, grooming and keeping a product backlog healthy, it's, it's like exercising. You have to do it on a regular, disciplined manner. And there's a lot that could be said. It's a very difficult and a challenging topic within the Scrum environment. I hope uh, what we have talked about over the last 40 minutes has helped you in some way. And if you have questions, I think we are ready to take it right after this. Thank you, Davil. I will be taking questions for the next couple of minutes and then addressing them. So go ahead and send in your questions now via the questions feature in GoToMe uh, webinar. Solutions IQ is a software consulting, training, and staffing company located here in the Pacific Northwest. We offer agile adoption services for every phase of a company's familiarity with agile, whether that's sending individuals to our public training courses or all the way up to having your entire company uh, be c converted to Agile from the executive level on down. We'll now take some questions. Well, we have one procedural question. Will the slide deck be available afterwards? Yes, the slide deck and its recording and the recording of the presentation will be available linked from the version one website after the presentation. So uh, we'll get that out to you guys and feel free to forward that to your friends so they can watch it too. Let's get on to the technical questions. Double. Yes. If you already have an overly large, overly detailed backlog, one of these thousand item monstrosities, how do you approach that problem? Uh, I've seen that happen many a times. And uh, I'm going to enumerate a series of steps that I have taken and that has helped me. I'm sure there are many different ways of addressing this. Uh, take your entire product backlog, and this may sound crazy, but Put every single item onto a single card and post all of those individual cards onto a big wall. You have 1,000 items on a big wall right now. With the product owner and the other stakeholders, group all of these items that sound similar or have the same value that they provide to your end users. You may find that there are some items that are that group well together. They are all part of a bigger team, something that all relates to probably the search functionality or something that relates about the hotfix that we are trying to provide into the next version. Group all of these and you'll see certain distinct groups. Label these groups as teams. When you have all of these groups labeled, prioritize these teams at a very high level. Look at the team that is the highest priority right now and the items that are the lowest priority. The team that is at the lowest priority, group all of them into a single product backlog item and express this team in terms of a user story, which means that you have a clear notion of who's going to benefit if this feature is developed, or this group of features is going to be developed, and what's the value that this feature will provide. That is your lowest priority item that should remain at the highest level of detail and, sorry, at the lowest level of detail and it should be of the largest size. Work backwards. See what are the items that are not relevant for you and what's the level of detail you need to provide. Now, in this situation, you may uh, throw away some of the extra details that you have, but if you want to protect that detail, you can protect it on a, on a forum that is away from your product backlog. You can protect that into a wiki. You can document it into a Word document and place it into a version control 
so that you can pull all of the information when needed. But you don't have to look at it right now. Does that help? That does. So group related stories together into themes and then treat the themes as the elements in the backlog. Yes. Cool. Um, so we have another question here. If the team wants to do a technical story to reduce their technical debt, right. but the product owner wants features yes. and doesn't want to invest in technical, how, how do you persuade or how, how do you balance those competing needs? That's a great question. Um, so I can tell you that your product owner is interested in the technical debt if you express it in a way where the product owner can understand. And that's where I talk about elevating uh, these technical debt items or even bugs or features that you want to develop to a level where they express the business value that you gain. So take, for example, uh, setting up a continuous integration environment. From a feature perspective, uh, that does not provide any feature to your end users. Your end users probably don't even know that you have automated unit tests. And that's something that you need in order to develop. Can you express that in terms of business value by saying that if we place in a continuous integration environment that runs all our unit tests, we can cut down the manual regression testing from about two weeks to one hour. That's all the effort that you have saved just by building this new functionality into our environment that allows you to build more features in the future. And that's an argument or that's a conversation that you can have with your product owner and help them understand what's the business value in order to reduce this technical debt. Uh, the thing about technical debt is that every single time, no matter how good you are, you will always know of some things that you could have done better. Now, do we actually have to fix every single thing that we think we should improve upon? Probably not. There is a business benefit to some of those and others, probably not. So have that discussion with your product and express in terms of business value that your product will get. And that will provide you a way to include some of the technical debt reduction items into your product backlog. Yeah, I know that Solutions IQ provides user story workshops that might help people see how to frame technical issues in a business value focus. Yes. We have another question here. Uh, how does the backlog and its relative granularity work with the roadmap in terms of communication on project completion? Um, nice. It's a really good question. So uh, a roadmap, it's actually, uh, it's an extension. It's, it's beyond. Uh, Mike Cohen talks about these uh, planning onion that has uh, the organizational vision, the portfolio, and the project, and then the product backlog. There's also the notion of five levels of planning where the roadmap sits above the uh, product backlog. A roadmap is talking about the milestones that you want to achieve with your product releases. The operative word here being the release. By a release, it's always a piece of functionality that is actually going to be shipped to your end users or to a select group of users. Now, reconciling your product roadmap to your product backlog means that you have defined your teams, uh, those large chunks of features that are expressed into your product roadmap. The details of those teams and what are the specific features are then further expressed in detail into your product backlog. So think of a roadmap as a higher level abstraction of the details that are captured into your product backlog. A roadmap provides just enough information for you to communicate within your organization and even outside the organization of what are the broad feature sets that we are providing. The specifics of these features will be captured into your product backlog and the exact details will be in your working software. Um. The question here is, one area you didn't mention is metrics for the user stories and release planning. Do you have any recommendations? And if you don't recommend your earlier webinar on Agile metrics, I will. <laughs> uh, so it was about metrics for product background? Metrics for user stories and release planning. Oh, oh. Um, so, uh, so you, okay, all product back, and this is a suggestion, um, all product backlog items are, are estimated in terms of story points. Story points is a relative measure that uh, estimates the level of effort that is involved in implementing story one as compared to story two. So if you have a story that is estimated at five points, you look at the next story and say, is it bigger than the five or is it smaller? If it's bigger, then let's call it an eight. 
And the steps that you take is typically a Fibonacci sequence, which has uh, the steps of 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13. So that's the measure that you apply to estimating your user stories. When you have a product backlog that has uh, story points for all the user stories, you can add all of these up. And you have about, say, a 100-point backlog. And your first release calls for about 50 points of the 100-point backlog to be delivered. Every single sprint, you can look at how much of your backlog is remaining in order to release. And you can chart what is called as a burn-up chart or a burn-down chart that always reflects the amount of story points that are remaining in order to release your feature. I'm going to mention that we have a previous Solutions IQ webinar uh, with version 1 available from the version 1 site that covers that topic of Agile metrics in much greater depth. I strongly recommend that you check there to flesh out that answer more thoroughly because here Donald had a couple of minutes there, he had 40. And uh, it's some excellent content on how to use Agile metrics in your project. We're going to have to wrap up now. We're out of time, but thank you all for attending our webinar, and uh, we hope that you have enjoyed learning how to maintain a well-groomed product back backlog. We have some upcoming webinars with version 1 on Agile portfolio metrics and on strategies for maximizing your Agile portfolio value. And uh, for copies of the presentation and the recording will be sent to you. For more information on Solutions IQ, check out our website or give us an email at info at solutionsiq.com. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you.